So I'll just follow your lead, Kathy, until I'm prodded, and then I'll unmute, okay? <laughs> you see the participant number increasing. Cool, cool. And then I will do an introduction in a bit. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Professor Kathy Thornton. I'm in the medical school at Swansea University. And I just wanna thank you for all joining us this afternoon for this presentation, which is part of our series of uh, talks and other events uh, during Healthcare Science Week. And we've got Dr. George Johnson with us today, and he's gonna give us some insight into his research on the causes of DNA damage. And I think one thing he's going to introduce us to is discovering why our festive fare may not be as wholesome as we think. So at least we're beyond Christmas and maybe we've got to start thinking about what we might eat coming up to Easter. Um, there's going to be an opportunity to ask George some questions at the end. So if you use a little question and answer feature on the bottom of your, of your uh, Zoom screen, don't use chat, please. Use the question and answer feature. You can pop those questions in there as we go through the presentation. Uh, and then we'll get to those questions after Dr. Johnson has given his presentation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Johnson and then he's going to uh, start on his presentation. So uh, George is an associate professor in the Institute of Life Science at the uh, Swansea University Medical School. And he lectures here on genetics and carries out research on the safety of pharmaceuticals, along with various chemicals in our environment and in our food. And his main area of expertise, which he's going to introduce us to today, is looking at the levels of cancer causing substances and ensuring that we, the human population, are exposed to sufficiently low levels that they don't damage our cells and our organs. He uh, has quite a global presence and he leads numerous global expert groups consisting of industrial scientists and government regulatory experts and fellow academics, and has recently become an expert on the Committee of Mutagenicity within the Department of Health, and he's also currently the president of the European Environmental Mutagenesis and Genomic Society. He's gonna share his expertise and insight with us this afternoon. And as I said, please feel free to pop some questions in the question and answer uh, option at the bottom of the Zoom screen. I'm going to turn my mic off and turn my camera off and hand over to George, and I'll join you at the end to go through the questions. Thank you, George. That's great. Thank you, Cathy. I'll just start sharing my screen. Hopefully I won't mess it up. If you could just give me a heads up when it's sharing, that would be really great. Yeah, so I think I'm sharing. You can jump in and tell me that I'm not, if, if that's the case, Cathy. Uh, so I'm pleased to be presenting today. The idea today is to make it quite a broad presentation covering the area of genetics, genetic damage and cancer, uh, and then some parts about my career, because the the offerings were to some of our alumni, to potential applicants, to the staff within the um, within the medical school and within the university as a whole, and also to the general public. So some of it will be going over some quite basic stuff from the experts and some quite quite advanced stuff if you're from the general public. So trying to make it quite broad and quite interesting is the plan. And I'm going to bring in a few controversial topics uh, just to sort of liven things up on this, uh, I think it's Friday afternoon now. So I'm covering DNA damage and cancer, the science and opportunities, go through the science and then some opportunities within this area um, of academia that I work in and how broad this job actually is at the current time um, to try to inspire the next generation of people to get into this area. So I work here, I'm an associate professor in genetics. I actually did my degree here in Swansea quite a few years ago now, then my PhD. And I really like Swansea, it's a good place to work and also to live, quite a lot of nice activities and everything. So really my progression through the different um, job profiles has, has gone quite well from my regard and uh, I enjoy working here as well. So I, I like to waffle on, but uh, 
I'll try to keep things going as well. So starting off with genetics, it's good to understand the foundation. So start off just talking about the human genome, when everything's correct with our DNA, what it looks like, talk about the cell cycle, again, what it looks like when the cell cycle is working very well, and then start getting into what happens when things go wrong with uh, the cell cycle, our DNA, and how this can lead to uh, cancer. The area that I'm interested in, the area that I do research in and I lecture on as well, is DNA damaging agents and cancer, where really we're looking at the environmental exposures to many different uh, mutagenic carcinogens in our diet, in say pharmaceuticals, petrochemical products, things like that, and to see how they cause cancer and at what levels they cause cancer, and to see if we can help the human population to reduce their genetic burden and uh, cancer risk. So that's where I get into my own research, some case examples where um, I've done some research and published on these sorts of topics. And then some thoughts about my career in academia, so to the next generation of scientists, whether they want a career in academia and what my mind currently looks like. So with the genome, this is the complete set of hereditary information encoded in our genetic material, our deoxyribonucleic acid. So this sits within our cells, within our nuclei, and the cells, you'll know some bits about some cells. Um, obviously, we've got cells throughout our body. Uh, most of these, apart from things like the red blood cells, will look a bit like this. Maybe the morphology of the outside will look a bit different. Most of them will look similar to like this on the inside. So we've got our nucleus, where the DNA is contained with the, the red arrow there pointing to that sort of big um, pink circle. That would be our nucleus. And a small portion of our DNA will be in our mitochondria. And really the idea of the cell here in genetics terms is we got the, the, the DNA in the nucleus codes for the genes, the, the genes code for uh, mRNA, which goes into the cytoplasm, the blue bit here, and most of those other things within the cell help to make proteins out of that information. So really the DNA codes for proteins and the proteins get made and the proteins do things. So the biochemical term will be deoxyribonucleic acid for that double helix structure there. We've got a lot of genes, we've got 22 and a half thousand. Previously before the Human Genome Project, we thought we had quite a few more than these, um, but really we've got this amount and there's lots of interaction to account for the complexity of the uh, human organism. And these are about 46, or not about, sorry, 46 chromosomes per human nucleus, unless there is a mutation and that number changes. The genome encodes the information required to generate proteins, as I just mentioned. So the DNA codes for the proteins, the proteins get made, then the proteins do things. These can be involved in, say, the organism structure, but the bits I'll be talking about today will be the performing the metabolic reactions necessary for life. And I'll really be talking mostly about the metabolic reactions around driving the cell cycle and what happens when this is correct, and then what happens when this is interfered with. So here's a simple cartoon of what the cell cycle will look like. So say we've got a skin cell, a liver cell, a lung cell, whatever cell it may be, and we'll go through this cell division and this cell division would take a different amount of time depending where it is in your body. But the general principle here is we've got a cell, wants to divide into two because we've got to keep replenishing our cell stocks. So in the G1 phase, this is just growth phase or gap phase, is when the cell can just grow gets a little bit bigger towards the end of this. And then the, um, it's, there's a decision point uh, called a restriction uh, site or a cell cycle checkpoint where the DNA and everything within the cell is checked to see if it's okay. And if it is okay, then the cell decides to duplicate the DNA, getting ready for um, mitosis or meiosis if it's the germ cells at the M phase at the top. So if everything's okay, your cell will then divide into two, the DNA will be duplicated, then you'll end up with two different cells. And there's some um, things that drive this process and these things when they're interfered with can lead to some of the hallmarks of cancer. So you've probably seen Paul Nurse on, on the news. He's um, quite a spokesperson for science, won the Nobel Prize in 2001, was head of the research councils as well, and director of the Francis Crick Institute. Really a leading geneticist um, globally. So Sir Paul uh, Nurse, FRS. And he won his Nobel Prize in 2001 through discovery and uh, characterization of some of the proteins within this cell cycle pathway, the cyclin dependent kinases specifically. And this really shows the genetic control of that cell cycle, which I've just shown you. And 
the cell cycle, if it, if it isn't controlled like this, your cells will just keep dividing and dividing and uncontrolled cell growth can lead to big lumps such as the uh, tumors that we see and so on. So this is a really tightly regulated process with these different genes. Some of the genes want to push the cell through cell cycle and some of them want to halt it and to check uh, for DNA damage, maybe repair it or maybe program the cell death. So I just want to get with this with this slide that we've got the cell cycle, we've got this control mechanism and the controls around it are, are genes and the genes code for the proteins. If it's all going well, the cells will divide and everything's OK. If they don't pick up the DNA, then that DNA damage will uh, generate into the daughter cells. And then that's where you get this um, development of the daughter cells being problematic, losing control of cell division and getting things like tumors forming. So because of all that, if we've got a simple uh, view of what cancer actually is, there's actually a more complicated version of this nowadays with say the eight hallmarks of cancer. But this one is a better diagrammatic representation for today. So three of the hallmarks, three of the six hallmarks of cancer are entirely linked to this control of the cell cycle. And that control of the cell cycle is down to these specific genes, mainly these oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes is what we call them. So we've got this green one at the top, self-sufficiency and growth signals. So if that is lost, then you end up with um, one of the hallmarks of cancer. If there's an anti-growth signal coming in and saying, okay, this cell should stop dividing, but the cell no longer recognizes that stop process, that's another hallmark. And limitless replicated potential at the bottom, this blue bit here. So half of the hallmarks of cancer and are entirely related to controlling this process that I've just shown you on the previous slide, the cell cycle. So if there's mutations in these sorts of genes, you can lead to these uh, hallmark, hallmarks of cancer being uh, realized. The other bits are important too, but maybe not so much for uh, the drive of this presentation with evading apoptosis being evading program cell death, uh, sustained angiogenesis with increased blood to the tumors, for example, and then meta metastasis where the, the cells can migrate and cause secondary tumors, things like that. But really the, the point of this slide is to show that half of the hallmarks of cancer are down to losing control of the cell cycle and cell growth. So why is this important? Why does this relate to the, my, my area of research? So if we're thinking about how that process can be disrupted, we think about mutations. So I'm going through the different types of mutations here, again, in quite simplistic terms, but hopefully in a suitable manner for the audience here. So the first ones that we are interested in would be G mutations, so base pair mutations. We know there's this genetic code, we've got these four bases and in a line they code for amino acids and a few amino acids in a row um, cause your proteins. So if you've got a change in your uh, base pair sequence here, we can change what that amino acid would look like and we can change what that protein will look like. So even just a small mutation here can be problematic and can lead to uh, aberrant cell cycle control. Chromosome mutation, this one at the top here, this is really to show that even once the DNA has all been nicely tightly wound around the histones and this is all stuck together in these nice um, traditional looking chromosomes, this sort of X, X looking conformation, you can get things that actually come along and break a part of that off. Things like ionizing radiation can do this quite easily. So you end up with all of that genetic material being lost. And if there's a specific uh, gene on that bit that's been lost, that would link to control of cell cycle, for example, then suddenly you've lost that control and the cell might proliferate with an uncontrolled um, pattern. Another way, and the reason I'm going into this is that chemicals we're exposed to you can do all of this stuff. So the genome mutation, if we're thinking about how we can um, go at the, at the big size, so can we gain or lose whole chromosomes? Yes, we can. Can we gain or lose whole sets of chromosomes? Yes, we can. Can some chemicals cause this? Again, yes, yes, they can. So within my area of research and my area of interest, I look at chemicals that can do these different things and there's tests to allow us to uh, measure how they do this with the mechanism um, at the concentrations they do this at the dose. So I thought just to expand on it a little bit, here is what the, the DNA mutation could look like. Here's the DNA structure. We've got the DNA double helix, and we're just looking at what happens when we make this into the mRNA and then the protein. So we've got this normal gene here coding for these amino acids down the bottom. Again, amino acids in a, in a line do the protein and the proteins do things. 
if we were just to cause one mutation here, we just swap this guanine to an adenine, this G to an A, we change this histidine uh, amino acid to a tyrosine. So just one base pair change, one small mutation can lead to the protein at the end product being, being changed. And if that protein is again due to say, picking up damage at the cell cycle checkpoint, and now that's lost, it's been mutated and it doesn't work, then that damage is gonna go through to the daughter cell and potentially lead to a tumor. Normally there's a few of these mutations that need to happen in key genes, but in simple terms, that's really what happens. You can get worse, uh, more damaging types of mutations as well. So instead of just changing the base around, what we've got here is we've got a base actually coming in, sticking itself in to the base pairing sequence, and everything after that is now incorrect. So a different type of mutation, but again, quite a prevalent one is a frame shift mutation. And these really mess up the, uh, the proteins that are gonna be coded for these genes quite badly. And there's a few chemicals that do this as well. What this can do, it can either make the, the protein, normally makes it absolutely massive, absolutely massive proteins can build up and cause things like neurodegenerative disorders, or if it's small, it just won't be functional. And obviously if all the amino acids have changed, then it's not gonna be doing its job. So it's gonna be a problematic. So how can we reduce this genetic burden? Where does it all come from? We've got these different um, sources of DNA damage. Um, so that's along the top. And then we've evolved lots of mechanisms to cope with certain levels of these. And that's the bit along the bottom. So we've got natural ways of causing DNA damage. So cellular metabolism, just the cells doing its own business can cause things like uh, reactive oxygen species that can interact with your DNA and cause damage. Replication errors, again, during say the synthesis phase of that cell cycle I just shown you, if that goes wrong, mutations come in. Then we've got external sources, things like UV uh, light exposure causing certain changes to your DNA. Um, and then we've got ionizing radiation that can do that. A bit more powerful can come in and smash the DNA apart, or it can come in and activate the water near your DNA. And again, reactive oxygen species causing the damage. But for today, we're looking at chemical exposure and the kind of chemicals we're exposed to in our food um, and the kind of chemicals we're exposed to in other sources, say industrial products, and our opinions of that as well, because I think that's interesting for us to think about. But we're not all dead. We uh, can cope with certain levels of, of this type of damage. There's a lot of this onslaught just ongoing naturally. And we've evolved these different mechanisms like the cell cycle checkpoint activation, which I keep mentioning, and then DNA repair as well. So certain molecules that um, link onto our DNA can be recognized and taken off and, and these can cope be coped with up to certain levels. And if it all goes wrong, the cell can recognize this, this cell is not doing very well and programmed cell death is apoptosis. So a dead cell is not gonna lead to a tumor because it's dead, which is a, a simple way of uh, sorting out the problem. So we know there's a cell cycle. We know there's mutations that can mess up the cell cycle. And now we, we know how the mutations can occur through the types of chemicals we're exposed to naturally and through our own systems as well. But that the, a low level of these can be coped with due to our evolved mechanisms. So I put these couple of slides in for interest and these have been uh, mentioned as well in the introduction. Nice one from Kathy, thank you. Um, and these would just um, set the scene for the types of chemicals you're exposed to and hopefully give you an opinion of industrial chemicals as well and where we are with sort of public opinion around that type of thing. So here we've got Bruce Ames, one of the leading experts in this area of genetic toxicology. Lois Gold, one of the leading experts in um, carcinogenesis from exposed chemicals as well. And they wrote up this uh, explanation here and stated that 99.99% of chemicals that we are exposed to are from the natural uh, food that we ingest and some of the cooking processes around that as well. And I think this is quite refreshing for us to think about. When you see in the press, most people think that chemicals are just man-made and come from say pharmaceuticals or pesticides or whatever but really chemicals are all around us and just have an appreciation of what a chemical actually is. So some of the, some of the nasty ones here, aflatoxin um, or mycotoxin up uh, on the right hand side there. If you let nuts, peanuts mostly, if you let some fungi grow on those, they will release aflatoxin and that can cause those frame shift mutations, those really bad ones that I showed you on a couple of slides ago. We've got benzene in tasty coffee, we will like our coffee. 
maybe it tastes nice, I don't know. Uh, benzoepyrene as well in, in coffee at certain levels as well. Really anything that you um, cook and you get this sort of charred effect will result in something like benzoepyrene, which is why it's one of the most um, prevalent carcinogens in cigarette smoke as well. And obviously you get more of it from cigarette smoke than you would from a coffee bean. And it's all about dose and mechanism and so on, as, I, as I've mentioned before. But I think this is important as you just read through some of these uh, different examples that we're exposed to all of these on, a, on pretty much a daily basis. Lots of these will interact with your DNA, cause those mutations that I've just shown you, but some of it will be repaired. You'll get this low level of mutation, but we can cope with a certain level of this DNA damage from these sorts of chemicals. Here's a few more as well. So even our, pump, even our say pumpkin pie or apple pie are still giving us levels of these genotoxic carcinogens. We've got coffee, it's got 20 known carcinogens, such as hydrogen peroxide that we bleach our hair with. Um, so lots of these tasty carcinogens that we just eat on a daily basis and we're quite happy about. There was a, a big study on the aflatoxin a couple of years ago, do you know the tasty brown bit when you overcook chips? That's aflatoxin and that's a known carcinogen as well. So it's just sort of levels, just doing, as your mum said, just a balanced diet, don't overdo any particular food um, and be careful with how you cook things. So how are we getting on? These are the chemicals we're exposed to, low levels of all of them. Um, so this needs to be considered when we're considering the extra genetic burden from chemicals that we're exposed to from say man-made products. I thought as well, because this was a public lecture, it'd be good to bring in a few more of those controversial ideas. So a guy I work with called um, Jim McGregor, he used to work in the Food and Drug Administration. He's retired more recently and thought he'd write this book. Um, and I've just got a few quotes from his book and I chat to him quite a lot about this sort of stuff. So he is one of the leading experts and he says that organic foods are not safer or more nutritious than conventional products. And this is a, a fact that I'm aware of as well. There's no research to show that organic foods are safer. Some of the organic pesticides used are actually uh, carcinogen carcinogenic as well, like rotenone, I think that's off the shelf, but you can use man-made pesticides. You can use uh, naturally produced pesticides with organic foods, that's okay. Sometimes when you don't add a pesticide to um, a plant, the plant will produce its own pesticide as well. So you actually get examples where some uh, organic potatoes have higher levels of um, naturally produced pesticides than those treated with, with um, man-made pesticides. And that kind of thing is just worth thinking about when you're really trying to argue against the very heavily tested and regulated pesticides that um, are on some of our food products at very low levels. Botanical supplements, this was quite an interesting one that um, we talked about in depth actually. So the botanical supplements that many people are quite uh, excited about and they think they're a very good um, food supplement or energy supplement, good life for like weightlifting or, or there's quite a few for sexual performance that are under this um, issue of frequently adult, adulted with biologically active chemicals. So when he was in the Food and Drug Administration, what he was seeing is that they would get say 10 different botanical supplements saying that they were the same thing. Some of them had none of that supplement actually in it. Some of them had lots. And some of them had actually had um, banned pharmaceuticals in there to give them an active, um, some activity. And this wasn't really regulated. So I think there's lots of bashing against the pharmaceutical industry, but really they're tested to quite a high level. So things like food additives, pharmaceuticals and pesticides are tested very heavily for the DNA damage, which I've just been showing you to make sure they don't cause DNA damage. And if they do, it's at very low levels that we're exposed to, all that DNA damage is within the background that we can withstand. Uh, and things like this as well, just to get your head around these superfood, these ake berries that I've probably pronounced incorrectly, uh, good antioxidant um, properties through these polyphenols, but those polyphenols are also the ones used as preservatives that people won't buy because they're branded as an e-number. So you wouldn't buy a product that has these, but then you would buy ake berries because they have these. So having this scientific understanding is, is a good thing as well. So I thought I'd just have that little bit of ramp because it was a nice, uh, <laughs> because it's a nice public platform and hopefully get you thinking about those sorts of things. I'm going to get into some of my projects now. So selective projects, chemicals that cause genetic damage. So when I started out, I think this was 2002, I did this project. So if my undergraduate, I was lucky to do this um, nice undergraduate project with Professor, the late Professor Jim Parry uh, and his wife, uh, Dr. Liz Parry. 
And we were looking at bisphenol A from plastic bottles and seeing what it did to cell division. As you know, I quite like cell division from the previous slide. So what we were seeing is that instead of the cells dividing into two, which is what you would like, the cells were dividing into three or four or even five from the same amount of genetic material. So obviously those daughter cells haven't got the right amount of DNA in them, and they're going to have some issues around them, and that could be a hallmark of cancer through aneuploidy and stuff like that. Uh, the more prevalent mechanism for causing cancer would be the endocrine disruption, but this was the mechanism that we were looking at as sponsored by the Food and Food Standards Agency. So I found this very exciting. I scared all my mates about reusing plastic bottles, don't wash them in detergent, stick them in the microwave, leave them in UV light, all that kind of stuff, and I got a publication out of it, and it made me think this was an interesting area to pursue. And also you get nice images out of it too. More well, recently, I've uh, got quite heavily linked to the pharmaceutical industry and the regulatory bodies underlying it as well. And there's a major incident with these Sartan drugs. So the blood pressure and heart medication drugs are called the Sartan drugs mostly. And there's a specific case with the Valsartan where there's this low level of a certain chemical, which I'll show you in a minute, meaning it shouldn't really be there, but quite a large proportion of people around the world had been exposed to this mutagenic carcinogen. So I've become a consultant to numerous companies on this and collaborate with expert groups on it, uh, and also an invited expert to regulatory bodies on this topic. So it's really down to my understanding of what this chemical does to your DNA, how it can be withstood at certain levels and what those certain levels are. So NDMA found as, in, as an impurity in Valsartan and other Sartans, these blood pressure and heart drugs. It was recalled in I think 22 com countries, the sixth most prescribed drug in the whole of America. So these have caused multi-billion pound court cases. And this is pretty high, high value stuff for the pharmaceutical industry. And also for the population that have been exposed to it. My mum was on this. I wanna make sure that she's not gonna get cancer from this exposure. So I've got that sort of uh, double interest in it as well. NDMA causes point mutations in cancer. It causes a GC2 AT mutation. As I've shown you with that previous figure, that can cause issues if it's in the right gene. And if that gene is a tumor suppressor gene or an oncogene, can increase your risk of cancer. But at certain levels, it can actually be withstood. So there is a really good mechanism for withstanding that. So the current question, are the human population safe? Are the people that have been exposed to this going to get cancer from their exposures? And as I said, there's lots of court cases around this. And I'm very much linked to a lot of this work with many different pharmaceutical companies and also the government regulatory bodies uh, to a lesser extent, but to a certain extent as well. Obviously stating conflict of interest if there's a direct uh, conflict of interest as you would expect. But on the flip side of this, as I've just shown you, these kind of chemicals are in our environment as well. So this particular chemical is actually in beer. Um, I quite like beer. I'm probably going to have a beer later on. In fact, I will have a beer later on. And I know that this stuff's in there, but I know that at certain levels, I'm okay with it. So the level is really important. I know the mechanism. I know what it's going to do, but I know at this certain level, it's going to be okay. It's in water as well and cooked meats as well. So really, it's all about dose for me. It's about mechanism, it's about dose. And this is really just comes back to the Paracelsus. The dose makes the poison. So the father of toxicology, everything can be problematic, can be dangerous. And really the dose is the, the thing of interest and really the mechanism when you build on that is of interest as well. Some stuff I've been doing more recently as well. So I do some of this actually with Kathy too, is imaging, uh, I can't read the top bit because it zooms in the way, um, but it's imaging flow cytometry and using artificial intelligence to score the different cells. So as computing power gets better, as the software gets better as well, you can actually use things like a deep learning artificial intelligence to help you with your studies too. So lots of my work is around looking at cells and trying to tell the difference between cells. So normally, we do that under the, like the microscope and get someone to score cells, so maybe like a thousand uh, cells every every half an hour. With these systems that we're using, it's about 10,000 cells every minute. But then you've got all of these different images that you're looking at with the imaging flow cytometry. And we want to be able to tell the difference between these. So we've been developing these deep learning algorithms to tell the difference between these, and it's going very well. We've got up to, I think, 95% precision on telling the difference between the different uh, cell types. 
obviously this is quite a lot of interest to different groups. We're working with a few different universities, including the Broad Institute in the US and a couple of companies as well, with GSK being uh, one that you'll be aware of. Had some good funding from uh, Welsh government and yeah, mostly Welsh government in different forms and Swansea University support over the years. And we got some papers coming out soon on this topic. So I get to do, I started out looking at things like bisphenol A and using these uh, cytogenetic techniques and now trying to build on that with the new advanced techniques and trying to build on that with this new computing power to advance everything uh, for my field and also for the things that I'm interesting around, interested in around the chemicals too. So this is slightly out of date because of COVID. I haven't been in the lab to grab all the big recent photos of everyone, but this is really just to show that um, scientists aren't aren't weirdos. Maybe some of us are weirdos. I could be a weirdo, I suppose, sometimes. But we're a nice group of people. Uh, Gareth Jenkins uh, runs the group, Professor Gareth Jenkins, Shereen Doak as well, Martin uh, Clift and myself here, and then the PhD, postdoc, undergraduate students as well. And these, this group changes uh, through the years, but just wanted to show you this excellent group that I work in in Swansea. When we're thinking about sort of career directions, I wanted to target this at the potential applicant. So when you're thinking about what you would like to do, I think it's nice to see what academics do and to realize the type of jobs that we do. So I'm just gonna sit on these uh, points for the next couple of slides. So my current roles, I teach at these different levels uh, from BSc up to PhD um, for the students. And then you do things like uh, continuing professional development, teaching as well, I teach teachers. I also teach industrial scientists and government regulatory scientists as well on different courses that I run. I uh, also have a role of employability as well uh, at the college level and the university level. So even just within the teaching profile, I do quite a lot of different things as do all academics. Research, I've shown you some of my research and something I haven't talked about too much is the data analysis side of thing. So I collaborate with lots of different companies and uh, Met different groups around the world, some academics as well. So I'm quite good at the analysis side of things. So they'll have some data and they want to get a bit more out of the data and I'll collaborate with them in, in assessing that data in different ways. Um, and we do lots of that nowadays. And that's a good way to get networks, it, new grants, collaborations, new publications and things like that. Uh, I've been doing a lot of consultancy as well. You saw one of my consultancy projects. I can't expand on, on any particular details of that at the moment with NDMA uh, because it's ongoing and confidential and that kind of stuff. But I work a lot with the pharmaceutical industry, with the chemical industry, with uh, food flavours, with uh, cosmetics. All these different bodies need uh, academic experts to assist them and to get as much as they can out of their data. Uh, so I do that and also for some government regulatory bodies as well in and under the consultancy role. Uh, also, as Cathy mentioned, I've uh, head and also I'm a member of a few different expert groups. So these aren't paid like the consultancy, but these are networks of experts to try to overcome problems in your specific areas. And these are really, really exciting things to be a part of. And I'm very fortunate to be a part of those. That's nice as well. I'm going to expand on societies in the next couple of slides too. And this is a nice thing for you to be a part of when you're an academic scientist. So I'm currently the president of one of these societies, the European Environmental Mutagenesis and Genomic Society. We run conferences and different meetings and so on and have quite a big network. Uh, and these allow you to travel the world quite a bit as well as I'll show you on my next slide. And with all jobs in any area that you're in, you've got the admin as well. And this can take up quite a lot of time. Uh, and don't talk to professionals about the admin because it's always something that uh, we get frustrated with, but we've got to put it on there because it's something we do as well. And I probably missed out some bits too. Basically, we do loads of different things and it's, it's very interesting and can be very busy, um, but it's definitely a good job. So while I chose to be an academic, universities in every nice city in the world, uh, you can improve human health as well and ensure in my area that the human population is not, does not have an increased genetic burden. Act on your own ideas. If you've got something like the deep learning idea that you wanted to pursue, then this is very well supported by the university and the, the grant opportunities that you can uh, get to fund these ideas. It's quite a lot of fun, it's very satisfying, and you can get some extra funds through things like spin-out companies or consultancy and so on. Uh, conferences allow you to travel, and the flexibility of the job allows you to do some fun things. I surf quite a lot on Paraglide when lockdown's not occurring. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a nice job and it's a nice place to be on Gower. 
Uh, I did promise that I would talk about conferences a little bit. I know this is not the best time to talk about traveling around the world, but as an academic, you get invited to speak at different conferences. And these uh, invites come with uh, airfare, the registration fee and travel uh, on site as well and the hotels, that kind of stuff. So this is a nice way to travel, go being like bungee jumping in Vancouver, uh, paragliding and snowboarding in the French Alps, surfing in Portugal, do some work with the National Institute of Health in Japan, Health Canada in Ottawa, go to Washington DC every year, it's my state nights in Brazil, and work a, a lot around Europe as well as you'd expect. So there's lots of benefits to being an academic, you do all the fun things that I've just shown you, and on the, on the back of it when you want to present all this data and you want to get a scientific network and disseminate all of your findings, you do that through these conferences and through other means as well. So really it's, it's a very nice job. And I think that is the last slide. I wasn't timing it, so sorry if I've underdone or overdone, Kathy. You can tell me I've been silly. And I think there's some questions that have popped up and uh, we'll work on those together. So I hope that was okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, George. I think you were spot on for time, so well done. <laughs> Um, as George said, we've got the opportunity for questions now. We've had three questions come through, so we'll start with those. Um, but if anyone else has got any other questions they want to ask George, please just pop them in the Q&A. So the first one is, uh, what do you know about rice? How much damage can it have? Why do Asians who have rice as their staple diet not seem to be affected by the toxins in the rice? Oh, I, I don't know the toxins in rice, so I'm afraid I can't address that directly to be honest I don't know what that that is but if it's an evolved mechanism then normally the exposed population to a staple diet will have developed some enzymes that the population that haven't been exposed to will have not developed so much so such as when the western world was um, using fruit to make to was be stored in water, we would have a higher level of alcohol. So we would have higher levels of alcohol dehydrogenase where the Western world wouldn't, wouldn't have that so much because they prepared and stored food in a different way. So it'd probably be something along those lines that there'd be an evolved set of enzymes that uh, Asians can cope with certain chemicals from rice to a greater extent than those who've not been exposed. But I'm sorry, I don't know what that particular chemical is, sorry. Okay, so we have another question about the artificial intelligence flow cytometry method that you presented. What is it detecting to differentiate between the cells? Is it detecting cell markers, genes? What is it that it's detecting? You can do all of all of uh, the things that you've suggested there. The one that we use, we firstly use cell morphology. So the cells that we're looking at, some of them have got a nucleus and a micronucleus, so a small dot of DNA in the cytoplasm and those look very different visually we can tell the computer software to to differentiate between those different populations we so that's the first answer that's what we do and there's different populations basically on the morphology they look a bit different there's different circles in the in the cell and we tell the computer which ones are important and should be scored and which ones shouldn't be but you can score for gene expression as well for gene presence or absence mainly by staining the easiest way is to stain the proteins that are produced thereafter and the presence or absence of those in the cells that you're looking at or the location of those proteins within the cells you can visually see this quite easily and you can tell the computer software you can tell the artificial intelligence whatever you like really that the one with the protein in this particular part of the nucleus is very important um, compared to the ones with that protein that's residing in the cytoplasm and the software would be able to different differentiate between those two different cells thereafter in a very accurate uh, manner. Okay, then we have another question about what are the main differences, uh, the main differences between being an academic scientist and an industrial scientist? Uh, I come up with two, I think, to start with. I th what, what we talk about when I, I got lots of mates in industry and the big pharmaceutical companies, and when people are starting out, what, what they say is academics can follow their own ideas to a greater extent, whereas with an industrial scientist, you'd be put onto a project and you may just do a part of that project and then it gets handed to someone else. So you do just do a part of it, it gets handed to someone else. But really, in, in realistic terms, when you get a bit more senior, you get the whole project to yourself. So I, I'm not sure that's a true statement. So what I, what I do think is quite different is, is the money. I think that 
the industrial scientists that I'm aware of in, in the pharmaceutical industry get roughly double uh, what I get. And I've, I've got cases where <laughs> I've got a PhD student that's just uh, graduated from a company and he's been offered $200,000 a year, which, which seems okay. So the money can be quite, quite larger in, 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 in the industry, but you haven't got all this flexibility. You don't work with students. You don't have these opportunities for independent consultancy, for spin out companies, for research, getting your own grants to do whatever you, whatever interests you and whatever research question you have to address. So I think it's more interesting for me to be as an academic, but I do see there are some benefits um, to be an industrialist as well. I like being in the middle. I work with industry a lot, but I'm an academic. OK, and then we have one that perhaps is in everybody's minds is how can bad diet affect the alterations in the DNA sequence? Uh, bad in many different ways. So one way, so obesity is obviously a big problem in, uh, in the Western world. And if we're talking about obesity with genetic damage, obesity can lead to higher levels of the estrogens. And some of those estrogens can lead to increased problems with cell division and cancer. So obesity can high, lead to higher levels of estradiol, for example, and cause um, quite large problems. I think if you've got I think there's some of the best examples maybe with overcooked meat. So if you if you heavily rely on a barbecue diet, uh, if you like those big steaks and you eat them nearly every night or, or that's the way you have to prepare food, then you're really being exposing yourself to many of these nasty PAHs and uh, polycyclic aromatic hybrid, hydrocarbon, things like that, uh, benzoapyrene. So really you can increase your um, chance of colonic, colon cancer by like fold changes if you barbecue your meat and have that on a regular basis so eat everything in moderation you can have barbecues but don't have them every night you can have some of the other things that i was mentioning but just don't have them every night you can have overcooked chips with acrylamide on them but just don't have too many of them and don't have them every night so everything in moderation as uh, you would have been told by your amazing parents Okay, so then we have a question sort of asking you to suggest what the big questions that there are that remain in your field to be answered, which are currently just out of reach due to lack of knowledge, technology, etc. So what are those sort of next generation of questions that we're going to be able to answer, I guess, with the sort of next advances in technology? I think one of the one of the dreams in genetics is that everyone is going to be able to sequence their whole genomes whenever they like um, and that will that will provide quite a big set of information for our field in genetic toxicology we'll be able to see if we've got predispositions to certain types of dna damage i'll be able to see if my dna repair mechanisms are working as well as someone else's whether they're upregulated if if there is a problem with my dna repair mechanism then i shouldn't be given certain chemotherapy drugs i shouldn't have a specific diet that sort of thing so i think you can have tailored med medicine uh, and this will come when everyone's sequence their, their DNA to a greater extent. So I think that will provide many advances for everyone in the area of genetics in particular. In my particular field, this, this discussion around dose responses is quite a big one. And uh, are all chemicals, can we cope with low levels of all genotoxic carcinogens? At the current time, the regulatory bodies say we can't with certain types of chemicals, including NDMA. They say that even if you have one molecule of that chemical, it's going to give you cancer and kill you. Whereas someone like myself would say one molecule, we can cope with that through DNA repair and low levels can be withstood because we're exposed to these sorts of things on a daily basis. And that's quite a big thing that needs to be overcome. And that's in every regulatory handbook that some things, even just one exposure of one molecule is going to kill you. And I, I don't agree with that. So I think that's a big one for us to overcome. And then I think we have the converse question. So we have a question from Mayer who studied under Jim Parry in the late 1960s hey. and it points out that Jim was already carrying out this work at that time and was one of the first in the field. So how far have we progressed since the 1960s then? So Jim was, yeah, as you say, he's, he was doing this for many years. He was um, essential to those antigenic chemicals and showing that low levels of those antigenic chemicals could be withstood and showed the mechanism for that where multiple hits were required before the, the cell was damaged and he was very much the leading expert he even coined the term antigen because he was such a global expert in the field of antigenicity and dose responses so he did that 
his my, my PhD was on this topic of can we do that same philosophy for chemicals that directly interact with your DNA and can that mechanism instead of multiple hits uh, that we can with uh, stand from the antigens can we extrapolate that to chemicals that interact with your DNA at the time that he was working on it I was the first project uh, to work on it with him. It wasn't accepted as a broad field, but it was accepted for that particular chemical. And now we're trying to progress on what Jim did to changing the whole field that all the chemicals we ex we're exposed to have a mechanism where low levels are okay. So I think that's quite a big progression, but his work on antigenicity, it won't progress much further than that. That was that was the top, and now it's the other DNA reactive substances that need to catch up. But I would, uh, thank you for coming along, Mayor Williams. That's excellent to see you. Okay, then we've got one which is sort of of the moment relating to vaccines and COVID nineteen. So, what are your personal thoughts on the longer term effects of the DNA and mRNA based vaccines, um, or the you know these genetically engineered vaccines? So Johnson and Johnson is a DNA and. Pfizer is an mRNA. So what are your thoughts on the longer term effects of those? From my perspective, from genetic damage and carcinogenesis, they're, they're not going to be an issue. We, we have exposures to uh, mRNA from viruses all the time, and they don't increase our genetic burden. Uh, depending where they come from. Do they come from a vaccine or do they come from the virus itself? Uh, in an endogenous source, they wouldn't increase our genetic burden. So I don't think there's gonna be an increased level of genetic damage based on these vaccines. But some of the other things like uh, gene manipulation, the CRISPRs, those sorts of things, those are still a bit up in the air for gene modification. Maybe they have off target um, issues, but again, that's another topic. So I think these vaccines, from my perspective, won't increase the population's level of uh, mutation or the level of cancer and I'm uh, yeah I'm very convinced about that I've never seen anything at all on the contrary and I work a lot on this sort of stuff. Okay um, and then we have again another question which will be in everyone's minds I think are there any lifestyle changes that can be made such as exercise that can reduce the number of free radicals and DNA damage? Uh, yes, actually overdoing it can increase your levels of reactive oxygen species. So if you overdo it, you play like two hours of uh, squash, that can actually increase your level of genetic burden. So you're going to want to do this for, for other reasons, for your other organs, but overdoing it, being too stressed in your work, being too stressed in your lifestyle by running a marathon every day, that kind of thing would increase your genetic burden. So again, just a healthy, balanced lifestyle would keep that at bay. We need a certain level of these free, uh, these reactive oxygen species for the cells to do their work. But we don't want too many and we don't want too few. So just do everything in a sensible manner. Don't overdo anything. Some of the, the marketing people will try to buy, try to sell you uh, antioxidants and say in January you should take loads of these antioxidants but they're free radicals so they react with your DNA very quickly so that's completely pointless um, so there's no real need to do that if you just have a good level of uh, antioxidants in your day-to-day -day diet you have your five bits of fruit and veg a day that will serve you very well so healthy balanced diet five bits of fruit and veg a day and uh, do your exercise but don't do crazy amounts of it because it could increase your genetic burden I hope that's okay yeah, and I think there you've answered the next question. So the next question was, if diet can damage our DNA and cause changes, which you focused on here, can it also repair it? So I think you've touched on that there at the end. Is there anything you want to add there, George? Uh, I, th no, I think I'm okay with that. There are some, there's two different sets of enzymes that could support that. So there'll be the DNA repair enzymes, and then there's the phase two enzymes, I think, phase two metabolic enzymes like glutathione that can actually mop up some of these chemicals and then you um, get rid of them in your urine and there could be some ways to upregulate those those types of enzymes but not from any particular types of food there's many areas some specific countries really put lots of research funding into looking at natural products that can do these sorts of things but again just a balanced lifestyle is is the best way don't overdo it don't buy all these supplements just just live in a balanced way and then here, I think this will be the last question for this afternoon, and it sort of relates to the nuts and bolts of your work is, where do you get the cells and the DNA from that you are using for your testing? Uh, that's a good, very good question. So in Swansea, we do in vitro work, we do cell line work, we don't do uh, animal work. 
with the cells that we uh, get. If you type it into Google, there's things like ATCC, and there's a European version of that as well. So back in the 70s, there would have been, so if you're getting Chinese hamster cells, there would have been a single uh, hamster where the ovary cells would have been extracted from those and grown up, and those would have gone towards the V79 cells. There's seven different types of these cells that are used in genetic toxicology mostly, and the TK6 cells that we use quite a lot here, and the MCR5 cells, those are human uh, blood cells. So blood can be extracted, and uh, this was done a few years ago. Those cells were immortalized by modifying the DNA a little bit, uh, and then those are uh, pulled up and sold to different academics and companies around the world. So we use in vitro systems, immortalized cell lines mostly, um, but you can use primary cell lines and Kathy's group does this quite a lot where they go around and grab everyone's blood uh, and then you can do experiments on these. And we do, we do some of that and industry likes that as well, but last time I did it, I passed out and it was slightly embarrassing. So that's what okay. we do. <laughs> on that note then George I think we'll call the uh, call this afternoon session to a close I'd like to start by thanking George for a really interesting and informative talk which I think has given us all food for thought and thoughts about our food so if I can also thank our audience for joining us today 